If you hate another person, that hate may bind you to him through as many lives as you allow the hate to consume you. You draw to yourself in this existence and in all others those qualities upon which you concentrate your attention. If you vividly concern yourself with the injustices you feel have been done you, then you attract more such experience. And if this goes on, then it will be mirrored in your next existence. It is true that in between lives there is time for understanding and contemplation. Those who do not take advantage of such opportunities in this life often do not do so when it is over. Consciousness will expand. It will create. It will turn itself inside out to do so. There is nothing outside of yourself that will force you to understand these issues or face them. It is useless then to say, when this life is over, I will look back upon my experience and then my ways. This is like a young man saying, when I grow old and retire, I will use all those abilities that I am not now developing. You are setting the stage for your next life now. The thought you think today will in one way or another become the fabric of your next existence. There are no magic words that will make you wise, that will fill you with understanding and compassion, that will expand your consciousness. Your thoughts and everyday experience contain the answers. Any successes in this life, any abilities, have been worked out through past experience. They are yours by right. You worked to develop them. If you look about you at your relatives, friends, acquaintances, and business associates, you will also see what kind of a person you are, for you are drawn to them as they are drawn to you through very basic inner similarities. Let me try to throw some light upon what I am trying to tell you. First of all, love always involves freedom. If a man says he loves you and yet denies you your freedom, then you often hate him. Yet, because of his words, you do not feel justified in the emotion. This sort of emotional tangle itself can lead to continued entanglements through various lives. If you hate evil, then beware of your conception of the word. Hate is restrictive. It narrows down your perception. It is indeed a dark glass that shadows all of your experience. You will find more and more to hate and bring the hated elements into your own experience. If you expand your sense of love, of health and existence, then you are drawn in this life and in others toward those qualities, again, because they are those upon which you concentrate. In the next life, you will be working with those attitudes that are now yours. If you insist upon harboring hatreds within you now, you are very likely to continue doing so. On the other hand, those sparks of truth intuition, love, joy, creativity, and accomplishment gained now will work for you then as they do now. They are, you see, the only true realities. They are the only real foundations of existence. It is foolish, as Rupert once said, to hate a storm or shake your fists at it and call it names. You may laugh if you think of children in such activities. It is useless to personify a storm and treat it as a demon focusing upon its destructive elements or those elements that to you appear destructive. Change of form is not destructive. The explosive energy of a storm is highly creative. Consciousness is not annihilated. A storm is part of creativity. You view it from your own perspective, and yet one individual will feel within the storm the unending cycle of creativity, and another will personify it as the work of the devil. Through all your lives, you will interpret the reality that you see in your own way, and that way will have its effect upon you, and in turn upon others. The man who literally hates immediately sets himself up in this fashion. He prejudges the nature of reality according to his own limited understanding. Now, I am emphasizing the issue of hate as I discuss reincarnation because its results can be so disastrous. A man who hates always believes himself justified. He never hates anything that he believes to be good. He thinks he is being just, therefore, in his hatred, but the hatred itself forms a very strong claim that will follow him throughout his lives until he learns that only the hatred itself is the destroyer. Now, Seth speaks of the dimensions of God and of the crucifixion of Christ. As the present life of any individual rises from hidden dimensions beyond those easily accessible in physical terms, and as it draws its energy and power to act from unconscious sources, 
so does the present physical universe, as you know it, rise from other dimensions. So does it have its source and derive its energy from deeper realities. History, as you know it, represents but one single light upon which you focus. You interpret the events that you see therein, and you project upon its glimmer your interpretation of events that may occur. So entranced is your concentration that when you wonder about the nature of reality, you automatically confine your question to this one small flickering moment that you call physical reality. When you ponder upon the aspects of God, you unthinkingly speak of the creator of that one light. That light is unique, and if you truly understood what it was, you would indeed understand the nature of true reality. Only a portion of your entire identity is presently familiar to you, as you know. Therefore, when you consider the question of a supreme being, you imagine a male personality with those abilities that you yourselves possess, with great emphasis upon qualities you admire. This imagined God has therefore changed throughout your centuries, mirroring man's shifting ideas of himself. God was seen as cruel and powerful when man believed that these were desirable characteristics, needed particularly in his battle for physical survival. He projected these upon his idea of a God because he envied them and feared them. You have cast your idea of God, therefore, in your own image. In a reality that is inconceivably multidimensional, the old concepts of God are relatively meaningless. Even the term, a supreme being, is in itself distortive, for you naturally project the qualities of human nature upon it. If you will try to accept the idea that your own existence is multidimensional, that you dwell within the medium of infinite probabilities, then you may catch a slight glimpse of the reality that is behind the word God. And you may understand why it is almost impossible to capture a true understanding of that concept in words. God, therefore, is first of all a creator, not of one physical universe, but of an infinite variety of probable existences, far more vast than those aspects of the physical universe with which your scientists are familiar. He did not simply send a son to live and die on one small planet. He is a part of all probabilities. There have been parables told and stories of beginnings. All of these have been attempts to transmit knowledge in as simple terms as possible. Often, answers were given to questions that literally have no meaning outside of your own system of reality. For example, there was no beginning and there will be no end. Yet, parables have been given telling you of beginnings and endings simply because with your distorted ideas of time, beginnings and endings seem to be inseparable, valid events. Your Christ figure represents, symbolically, your idea of God and his relationships. There were three separate individuals whose history blended, and they became known collectively as Christ. Hence, many discrepancies in your records. These were all males, because at that time of your development, you would not have accepted a female counterpart. These individuals were a part of one entity. You could not but imagine God as a father. It would never have occurred to you to imagine a God in any other than human terms, earth components. The events of the crucifixion of Christ, as they are recorded, did not occur in history. It was a psychic, but not a physical event. Ideas of almost unimaginable magnitude were played out. Judas, for example, was not a man in your terms. He was, like all the other disciples, a blessed, created, fragment personality formed by the Christ personality. He represented the self-betrayer. He dramatized a portion of each individual's personality that focuses upon physical reality in a grasping manner and denies the inner self out of greed. Each of the twelve represented qualities of personality that belong to one individual, and Christ as you know him represented the inner self. The twelve, therefore, plus Christ as you know him, the one figure composed of the three, represented an individual earthly personality, that is, the inner self and twelve main characteristics connected with the egotistical self. As Christ was surrounded by the disciples, so the inner self is surrounded by these physically oriented characteristics, each drawn outward toward daily reality on the one hand, and yet orbiting the inner self. The disciples, therefore, were given physical reality by the inner self, as all of your earthly characteristics come out of your inner nature. This was a living parable, made flesh among you, a cosmic play worked out for your behalf, couched in terms that you could understand. The lessons were made plain, 
as all the ideas behind them were personified. If you will forgive the term, this was like a local morality play put on in your corner of the universe. This does not mean it was less real than you previously supposed. In fact, the implications of what is said here should clearly hint at the more powerful aspects of godhood. The same kinds of dramas in different ways have been given, and while the drama is always different, it is always the same. This does not mean that a Christ has appeared within each system of reality. It means that the idea of God has manifested within each system in a way that is comprehensible to the inhabitants. This drama continues to exist. It does not belong, for example, to your past. Only you have placed it there. This does not mean that it always reoccurs. The drama, then, was far from meaningless, and the spirit of Christ, in your terms, is legitimate. As I said, the crucifixion was a psychic event, and exists as do all the other events connected with the drama. Christ, the historical Christ, was not crucified. He had no intention of dying in that manner. But others felt that to fulfill the prophecies in all ways, crucifixion was a necessity. Christ did not take part in it. There was a conspiracy in which Judas played a role, an attempt to make a martyr out of Christ. The man chosen was drugged, hence the necessity of helping him carry the cross, and he was told that he was the Christ. He believed that he was. He was one of those deluded, but he also himself believed that he, not the historical Christ, was to fulfill the prophecies. Mary came because she was full of sorrow for the man who believed he was her son. Out of compassion, she was present. The group responsible wanted it to appear that one particular portion of the Jews had crucified Christ and never dreamed that the whole Jewish people would be blamed. The tomb was empty because the same group carted the body away. Mary Magdalene did see Christ, however, immediately after. Christ was a great psychic. He caused the wounds to appear then upon his own body and appeared both physically and in out-of-body states to his followers. He tried, however, to explain what had happened and his position, but those who were not in on the conspiracy would not understand and misread his statements. Peter three times denied the Lord, saying he did not know him, because he recognized that that person was not Christ. The plea, Peter, why hast thou forsaken me, came from the man who believed he was Christ, the drug version. Judas pointed out that man. He knew of the conspiracy and feared that the real Christ would be captured. Therefore he handed over to the authorities a man known to be a self-styled Messiah to save, not destroy, the life of the historical Christ. Symbolically, however, the crucifixion idea itself embodied deep dilemmas and meanings of the human psyche, and so the crucifixion per se became a far greater reality than the actual physical events that occurred at the time. Only the deluded are in danger of, or capable of, such self-sacrifice, you see, or find it necessary. Only those still bound up in ideas of crime and punishment would be attracted to that kind of religious drama and find within it deep echoes of their own subjective feelings. Christ knew clairvoyantly that these events in one way or another would occur and the probable dramas that could result. The man involved could not be swerved from his subjective decision. He would be sacrificed to make the old Jewish prophecies come true and he could not be dissuaded. In the Last Supper, when Christ said, this is my body and this is my blood. He meant to show that the spirit was within all matter, interconnected and yet apart. That his own spirit was independent of his body and also in his own way to hint that he should no longer be identified with his body. For he knew the dead body would not be his own. This was all misunderstood. Christ then changed his mode of behavior, appearing quite often in out-of-body states to his followers. Before, he had not done this to that degree. He tried to tell them, however, that he was not dead, and they chose to take him symbolically. His physical presence was no longer necessary, and was even an embarrassment under the circumstances. He simply willed himself out of it. He knew that without the wounds, they would not believe he was himself, because they were so convinced that he died with those wounds. They were to be a method of identification, to be dispensed with when he explained the true circumstances. He ate to prove he was still alive, but they took this simply to mean that the spirit could partake of food. They wanted to believe that he had been crucified and arisen. Other religions were based upon different traumas, 
in which ideas were acted out in a way that was comprehensible to various cultures. Unfortunately, the differences between the dramas often led to misunderstandings, and these were used as excuses for wars. These dramas are also privately worked out in the dream state. In visions and inspirations, men knew that the Christ drama would be enacted and hence recognized it for what it was when it occurred physically. Its power and strength then returned to the dream universe. It had increased its vigor and intensity through the physical materialization. In private dreams, men then related to the main figures in the drama, and in the dream state, they recognized its true import. God is more than the sum of all the probable systems of reality He has created, and yet He is within each one of these, without exception. He is therefore within each man and woman. He is also within each spider, shadow, and frog, and this is what man does not like to admit. God can only be experienced, and you experience Him, whether or not you realize it, through your own existence. He is not male or female, however, and I use the terms only for convenience's sake. In the most inescapable truth, he is not human in your terms at all, nor in your terms is he a personality. Your ideas of personality are too limited to contain the facets of his multidimensional existence. The inner experience with the multidimensional God can come in two main areas. One is through the realization that this prime moving force is within everything that you can perceive with your senses. The other method is to realize that this primary motive force has a reality independent of its connection with the world of appearances. As there are portions of reality that you do not consciously perceive, and other systems of probability of which you are not consciously aware, so also other aspects of primary godhood that you cannot at this moment comprehend. I have tried to give you some idea of the far-reaching creative effects of your own thoughts. With that in mind, then, it is impossible to imagine the multidimensional creativities that can be attributed to all that is. The term, all that is, can be used as a designation to include all of those probable gods in all of their manifestations. Now, it is easier, perhaps, for some of you to understand the simple stories and parables of beginnings of which I have spoken. But the time has come for mankind to take several steps further, to expand the nature of his own consciousness by trying to comprehend a more profound version of reality. You have outgrown the time of children's tales. When your own thoughts have a form and reality, when they have validity even in other systems of reality of which you are unaware, then it is not difficult to understand why other systems of probabilities are also affected by your own thoughts and emotions. Seth now speaks of reincarnation in terms of entire civilizations, such as those that preceded the existence of Atlantis. In a manner of speaking, it can be said that you have reincarnational civilizations as well as reincarnating individuals. Each entity who is born in flesh works toward the development of those abilities that can be best nurtured and fulfilled within the physical environment. He has a responsibility to and for the civilization in which he has each existence, for he helps form it through his own thoughts, emotions, and actions. He learns from failure as well as success, you think of physical history as beginning with the caveman and continuing up to the present, but there have been other great scientific civilizations, some spoken of in legend, some completely unknown, all in your terms, now vanished. It seems to you that you have, perhaps, but one chance as a species to solve your problems, or be destroyed by your own aggression, by your own lack of understanding and spirituality. But as you are given many lives in which to develop and fulfill your abilities, so has the species in those terms been allotted more than the single line of historical development with which you are presently acquainted. Groups of people in various cycles of reincarnational activity have met crisis after crisis, have come to your point of physical development and either gone beyond it or destroyed their particular civilization. In this case, they were given another chance, having the unconscious knowledge not only of their failure but the reasons behind it. 
they then began with a psychological head start as they formed new primitive groupings. Others, solving the problems, left your physical planet for other points in the physical universe. When they reached that level of development, however, they were spiritually and psychically mature and were able to utilize energies of which you now have no practical knowledge. Earth, to them, now is the legendary home. They formed new races and species that could no longer physically accommodate themselves to your atmospheric conditions. However, they also continued on the reincarnational level as long as they inhabited physical reality. Some of these have mutated and have long left the reincarnational cycle, however. Those who left it have evolved into the mental entities that they always were, you see. They have discarded material form. This group of entities still takes a great interest in Earth. They lend its support and energy. In a way, they could be thought of now as Earth gods. On your planet, they were involved in three particular civilizations long before the time of Atlantis, when, in fact, your planet itself was in a somewhat different position, particularly in relationship to three of the other planets that you know. The poles were reversed, as they were, incidentally, for three long periods of your planet's history. These civilizations were highly technological, the second one being, in fact, far superior to your own along those lines. Sound was utilized far more effectively, not only for healing and in wars, but also to power vehicles of locomotion and to bring about the movement of physical matter. Sound was a conveyor of weight and mass. The strength of this second civilization lay mainly in the areas now known as Africa and Australia, although at that time, not only was the climate entirely different, but the land areas. There was a different attraction of land mass having to do with the altered position of the poles. Relatively speaking, however, the civilization was concentrated in area. It did not attempt to expand. It was highly ingrown and dwelled upon the planet simultaneously with a large, unorganized, dispersed, primitive culture. Not only did it make no attempt to civilize the rest of the world, but it did everything in its power, which was considerable for a long period of time, to impede any such progress. The members of this civilization were largely a fringe group from the earlier successful civilization, most of whom had decided to continue existence in other areas of your physical universe. These, however, were particularly enamored of earthly life and also thought that they could improve upon the last experiment in which they had been involved, though they were free to move on to other layers of existence. They were not interested in beginning from scratch again as an infant civilization, but in other areas. Therefore, much of their knowledge was instinctive with them, and this particular group then went through what you would call the various technological stages very rapidly. They were particularly concerned in the beginning with developing a human being who would have built-in safeguards against violence. With them, the desire for peace was almost what you would call an instinct. This civilization, therefore, left the natives that surrounded them in peace. They did send out members of their own group, however, to live with the natives and intermarry, hoping peacefully to thus alter the physiology of the species. The energy, often in your time given over to violence, went instead into other pursuits, but began to turn against them. They were not learning to deal with violence or aggression. They were attempting to short-circuit it physically, and this, they found, had complications. The physical alteration was a strain on the entire system. The urge to act, which is the creative function and basis that has been distorted into the idea of aggression, was not understood. An overly conscientious, restrictive mental and physical state evolved, in which the organism's natural physical need for survival was in every way hampered. Mentally, the civilization progressed. Its technology was extremely activated, and propelled onward as it strove to develop, for example, artificial foods so that it would not need to kill for survival in any way. At the same time, it tried to leave the environment intact. It missed your stage of automobiles completely and steam-driven vehicles and concentrated rather early on sound. The sound could not be heard by physical ears. The civilization was called Lumania, and the name itself went down in legend and was used again at a later time. The Lumanians were a very thin, weakly people, physically speaking, but psychically either brilliant or completely ungifted. In some, you see, the built-in controls caused so many blockages of energy in all directions 
that even their naturally high telepathic abilities suffered. They formed energy fields around their own civilization. They were, therefore, isolated from contact with other groups. They did not allow technology to destroy them, however. More and more of them realized that the experiment was not a success. Some, after physical death, left to join those from the previous successful civilization who had migrated to other planetary systems within the physical structure. Large groups, however, simply left their cities, destroyed the force fields that had enclosed them, and joined the many groups of relatively uncivilized people mating with them and bearing children. These Lumanians died quickly, for they could not bear violence nor react to it violently. If attacked, they had to flee. The fight-or-flight principle did not apply. The Lumanians' god symbol was a male one, a strong, physically powerful male figure who would therefore protect them since they could not protect themselves. He evolved through the ages, as their beliefs did, and into him they projected those qualities that they could not themselves express. He was much later to appear as the old Jehovah, the god of wrath who protected the chosen people. The fear of natural forces was, therefore, initially extremely strong in them, and brought about a feeling of separation between man and those natural forces that nurtured him. They could not trust the earth, since they were not allowed to protect themselves against violent forces within it. Their vast technology and their great civilization was largely underground. They were, in those terms, the original cavemen, and they came out from their cities through caves also. Caves were not just places of protection in which unskilled natives squatted, they were often doorways to and from the cities of the Lumanians. Long after the cities were deserted, the following natives, uncivilized, found these caves and the openings. In the period that you now think of as the Stone Age, the men you think of as your ancestors, the cavemen, often found shelter not in rough, naturally formed caves, but in mechanically created channels that reached behind them and in the deserted cities in which once the Lumanians dwelled. Some of the tools fashioned by the cavemen were distorted versions of those they had found. I should perhaps mention here that some of the caves, particularly in certain areas of Spain and the Pyrenees, and some earlier ones in Africa, were artificial constructions. Now, these people moved mass with sound and actually conveyed matter through a high mastery of sound. This is how their tunnels were originally formed and it was also the method used to form some of the caves in areas where originally there were few. Often, drawings on the cave walls were highly stylized information, almost like signs in your terms in front of public buildings, portraying the type of animals and beings in a given area. These drawings later were used as models by your early cavemen in the historical times to which you usually refer. The Lumanian civilization was the second and perhaps most interesting of the three civilizations. The first followed generally your own line of development and faced many of the problems that you now do. They were largely situated in what you call Asia Minor, but they were also expansive and traveled outward to other areas. These are the people I mentioned earlier who finally went on to other planets within other galaxies and from whom the people of the Lumanian civilization came. I have been speaking about the Lumanians in some detail because they are a part of your psychic heritage. The other two civilizations were in many ways more successful, and yet the strong intent behind the Lumanians' experiment was extremely volatile. While they were not able to solve the problem of violence, as they understood it in your reality, their passionate desire to do so still rings throughout your own psychic environment. Because of the true nature of time, the Lumanians still exist as they were in your terms. There are often bleed-throughs in the psychic atmosphere, these do not occur by chance, but when some kind of rapport causes effects to leap between systems that otherwise appear quite separated. And so, there have been such bleed-throughs between your own civilization and the Lumanians. Various old religions picked up the idea of the Lumanians' fierce god figure, for example, in whom they managed to project their concepts of force, power, and violence. This god who had meant to protect them when nonviolence would not allow them to protect themselves. There is a bleed-through now in the making, so to speak, in which the Lumanians' multidimensional concepts of art and communication will be glimpsed by our own people, but in a rudimentary form. As the various qualities of the Lumanians are still present in your psychic atmosphere, 
as their cities still coexist in land areas now called your own, so other probable identities coexist with the identities you now call your own. Now, Seth turns to the subject of the speakers. Christian dogma speaks of the ascension of Christ, implying, of course, a vertical ascent into the heavens, and the development of the soul is often discussed in terms of direction. To progress is supposedly to ascend, while the horror of religious punishment, hell, is seen at the bottom of all things. Development is therefore considered in a one-line direction only, in Christian terms. But development unfolds in all directions. The soul is not ascending a series of stairs, each one representing a new and higher point of development. Instead, the soul stands at the center of itself, exploring, extending its capacities in all directions at once, involved in issues of creativity, each one highly legitimate. For this reason, the nature of good and evil is a highly important point. We go back to our fundamentals. You create reality through your feelings, thoughts, and mental actions. You must understand that each mental act is a reality for which you are responsible. That is what you are in this particular system of reality for. As long as you believe in a devil, for example, you will create one that is real enough for you and for the others who continue to create him. Because of the energy he is given by others, he will have a certain consciousness of his own. But such a mock devil has no power or reality to those who do not believe in his existence and who do not give him energy through their belief. He is, in other words, a superlative hallucination. Some very old religions understood the hallucinatory nature of the devil concept, but even in Egyptian times, the simpler and more distorted ideas became prevalent, particularly with the masses of people. In some ways, men in those times could not understand the concept of a god without the concept of a devil. There are no devils waiting to carry anyone off, unless you create them yourself, in which case the power resides in you and not in the mock devils. The crucifixion of Christ and the attendant drama made sense within your reality at the time. It arose into the world of physical actuality out of the inner reality from which your deepest intuitions and insights also spring. The methods, the secret methods behind all of the religions, were meant to lead man into a realm of understanding that existed apart from the symbols and the stories, lead him into inner realizations that would take him both within and without the physical world that he knew. There are many manuscripts still not discovered from old monasteries, particularly in Spain, that tell of underground groups within religious orders who kept these secrets alive when other monks were copying old Latin manuscripts. There were tribes who never learned to write in Africa and Australia who also knew these secrets, and men called speakers who memorized them and spread them upward even throughout northern portions of Europe before the time of Christ. There have been less than thirty great speakers. The Christ entity was one. The Buddha was another. These speakers are as active when they are non-physical as when they are physical. The Christ entity had many reincarnations before the emergence of the Christ personality as known, as did the Buddha. The original source of the speaker data is the inner knowledge of the nature of reality that is within each individual. The speakers are to keep the information alive in physical terms, to see that men do not bury it within and dam it up, to bring the information to the attention of the conscious self. The Druids obtained some of their concepts from speakers. So did the Egyptians. The speakers predated the emergence of any religions that you know, and the religions of the speakers arose spontaneously in many scattered areas, then grew like wildfire from the heart of Africa and Australia. There was one separate group in an area where the Aztecs dwelled at a later date, though the land mass was somewhat different then, and some of the lower cave dwellings at times were underwater. Various bands of the speakers continued through the centuries. Because they were trained so well, the messages retained their authenticity. They believed, however, that it was wrong to set words into written form, and so did not record them. The speakers, singly, existed in your Stone Age period and were leaders. Their abilities helped the cavemen survive. There was little physical communication, however, in those days between the various speakers, and some were unaware of the existence of the others. 
Their message was as pure and undistorted as possible. It was for this reason, however, through the centuries, that many who heard it translated it into parables and tales. Now, strong portions of Jewish scriptures carry traces of the message of these early speakers, but even here, distortions have hidden the messages. Since consciousness forms matter, and not the other way around, then thought exists before the brain and after it. A child can think coherently before he learns vocabulary, but he cannot impress the physical universe in its terms. So this inner knowledge has always been available, but has to become physically manifest, literally made flesh. The speakers were the first to impress this inner knowledge upon the physical system, to make it physically known. Sometimes only one or two speakers were alive in several centuries. Sometimes there were many. They looked around them and knew that the world sprang from their interior reality. They told others. They knew that the seemingly solid natural objects about them were composed of many minute consciousnesses. They realized that from their own creativity they formed idea into matter, and that the stuff of matter was itself conscious and alive. They were intimately familiar with the natural rapport existing between themselves and their environment, and knew that they could alter their environment through their own acts. The speakers possess an extraordinary vividness of feeling and thought projection. They can impress others with greater import through their communications. They can move from inner to outer reality with easy ability. They know instinctively how to use symbolism. They are highly creative on an unconscious level, constantly forming psychic frameworks beneath normal consciousness that can be used both by themselves and others in dream and trance states. They often appear to others in the dream condition, and they help dreamers in the manipulation of inner reality. They form images with which the dreamers can relate, images that can be used as bridges and then as gateways into kinds of consciousness more separated from your own. The symbolism of the gods, the idea of the gods on Olympus, for example, the crossing over point at the river Styx, that kind of phenomena was originated by the speakers. The speakers were not confined in their activities to waking consciousness. In all periods of your time, they went about their duties both in the waking and sleep state. Conventional images of the Christian God and the saints may be utilized by the speakers with all of this highly vivid. The dreamer may find himself then in a magnificent harem or instead in a brilliantly illuminated field or sky. Some speakers confine their abilities to the dream state and waking are largely unconscious of their own abilities or experience. Now, it is meaningless to call such dreams or dream places hallucinations, for they are representations of definitive, objective realities that you cannot perceive as yet in their own guise. The Egyptian religion was largely based upon the work of the speakers, and great care was given to their training. The outward manifestations given to the masses of the people became so distorted, however, that the original unity of the religion finally decayed. Each individual in his dreams has access to the information possessed by the speakers. There are adjacent states of consciousness that occur within the sleep pattern that cannot be picked up by your EEGs, that is, your scientific tracings of brain waves, adjacent corridors through which your consciousness travels. Now, this happens in every night's sleep. Two areas of activity are involved, one very passive and one acutely active. In one state, this portion of consciousness is passive, receiving information. In the next stage, it is active as it takes part through action. The concepts given it are then vividly perceived through participation and examples. This is the most protected area of sleep. The rejuvenating characteristics enter in here, and it is during this period that the speakers act as teachers and guides. Through the ages, the speakers have taught dreamers how to manipulate in these other environments. They have taught them how to bring back information that could be used for the good of the present personality. According to the intent, present purpose, and development, an individual may be aware of these travels to varying degrees. Some have excellent recall, for example, but often misinterpret their experience because of conscious ideas. It is very possible for one dreamer who is a speaker to go to the aid of another individual who is having some difficulties in an inner reality within the dream state. The idea of guardian angels, of course, is highly connected here. A good speaker is as effective within one reality as he is within the other, creating
creating psychic frameworks within physical reality as well as within interior environments. Many artists, poets, and musicians are speakers, translating one world in terms of another, forming psychic structures that exist in both with great vitality, structures that may be perceived from more than one reality at a time. Most dreams are like animated postcards brought back from a journey that you have returned from and largely forgotten. The speakers help you in the formation of dreams which are indeed multidimensional artistic productions of a kind. Dreams existing in more than one reality with effects that dissect various stages of consciousness that are real, in your terms, to both the living and the dead and which both the living and the dead may participate. It is for this reason that inspirations and revelations are so often a part of the dream condition. Consciousness at different levels or stages perceives different kinds of events. In order to perceive some of these, you have only to learn to change the focus of your attention from one level to another. These stages of consciousness are all a part of your own reality. A knowledge of them can be most useful. You can learn to shift gears, stand aside from your own experience, and examine it with much better perspective. You can prepare questions or problems, suggesting that they be solved for you in the sleep state. You can suggest that you will speak with distant friends or convey important messages that you cannot convey verbally, perhaps. You can bring about reconciliations, for example, at another layer of reality, though you cannot do so in this one. You can direct the healing of your body, telling yourself that this will be accomplished by you at one of the other levels of sleep consciousness. You may ask for the aid of a speaker to give you any necessary psychological guidance that is needed to maintain health. If you have particular conscious goals, and if you are reasonably certain that they are beneficial ones, then you can suggest dreams in which they occur, for the dreams themselves will hasten their physical reality. Now, unconsciously, you do many of these things. You often go back in time, so to speak, and relive a particular event so that it has a different ending, or say things that you wish you had said. A knowledge of one state of consciousness can help you in other states. In a light trance, the meaning of dream symbols will be given if you ask for them. The symbols may then be used as methods of suggestion that will be tailored for you personally. If you discover, say, that a fountain in a dream represents refreshment, then when you are tired or depressed, think of a fountain. The production of dreams is as sophisticated an endeavor as is the production of the objective life of a given individual. It is simply living on different terms. And now, Seth discusses the meaning of religion and the second coming. The outer world is a reflection of the inner one, though far from perfect. The inner knowledge can be compared to a book about a homeland that a traveler takes with him into a strange country. Each man is born with the yearning to make these truths real for himself, though he sees a great difference between them and the environment in which he lives. An internal drama is carried on by each individual, a psychic drama which is finally projected outward with great force upon the field of history. The birth of great religious events emerges from the interior religious drama. The drama itself is a psychological phenomenon in a way, for each physically oriented self feels thrust alone into a strange environment without knowing its origins or destination or even the reason for its own existence. Thus, you deal often with events in which men are touched by great illumination, isolated from the masses of humanity and endowed with great powers. Periods of history that appear almost unnaturally brilliant in contrast with others. Prophets, geniuses, and kings shown in greater than human proportion. These people are chosen by others to manifest outwardly the interior truths that all intuitively know. There are many levels of significance here. On the one hand, such individuals receive their unearthly abilities and power from their fellows, contain it, exhibit it in the physical world for all to see. They play the part of the blessed inner self that actually cannot operate within physical reality uncloaked by flesh. This energy, however, is a quite valid projection from the interior self. The personality so touched by it actually does then become, in certain terms, what he seems to be. He will emerge as an eternal hero in the external religious drama, 
as the inner self is the eternal hero of the interior religious drama. When such a personality appears in history, then, he is intuitively recognized, for the way has long been laid, and in many cases the prophecies announcing such an arrival have already been given. The individuals so chosen do not just happen to appear among you. They are not chosen at random. They are individuals who have taken upon themselves the responsibility for this role. After their birth, they are aware to varying degrees of their destiny, and certain trigger experiences may at times arouse their full memory. They serve quite clearly as human representatives of all that is. Now, since each individual is a part of all that is, to some extent each of you serve in that same role. In such a religious drama, however, the main personality is much more conscious of his inner knowledge. He is more aware of his abilities, far better able to use them, and exultantly familiar with his relations to all of life. Ideas of good and evil, gods and devils, salvation and damnation, are merely symbols of deeper religious values, cosmic values, if you will, that cannot be translated into physical terms. These ideas become the driving themes of these religious dramas of which I have spoken. The actors may return, time and time again, in different roles. In any given historic religious drama, the actors may have already appeared on the historic scene in your past, the prophet of today being the traitor of the past drama. Behind the actors in the dramas, there are more powerful entities who are quite beyond role-playing. The plays themselves, then, the religions that sweep across the ages, these are merely shadows, though helpful ones. Behind the frame of good and evil is a far deeper spiritual value. All religions, therefore, while trying to catch truth, must to some large degree fear its ever eluding them. The main character in a religious historical drama may or may not consciously be aware of the ways in which such information is given to him, and yet it may seem to him that he does know, for the nature of a dogma's origin will be explained in terms that this main character can understand. The historical Jesus knew who he was, but he also knew that he was one of three personalities composing one entity. To a large extent, he shared in the memory of the other two. The third personality has not in your terms yet appeared, although his existence has been prophesied as the second coming. Now, these prophecies were given in terms of the current culture at that time, and therefore, while the stage has been set, the distortions are deplorable. This Christ will not come at the end of your world, as the prophecies have been maintaining. He will not come to reward the righteous and send evildoers to eternal doom. He will, however, begin a new religious drama. A certain historical continuity will be maintained. As happened once before, however, he will not be generally known for who he is. There will be no glorious proclamation to which the whole world will bow. He will return to straighten out Christianity, which will be in a shambles at the time of his arrival, and to set up a new system of thought when the world is sorely in need of one. By that time, all religions will be in severe crisis. He will undermine religious organizations, not unite them. His message will be that of the individual in relation to all that is. He will clearly state methods by which each individual can attain a state of intimate contact with his own entity, the entity to some extent being man's mediator with all that is. By 2075, all of this will be already accomplished. You may make a note here that Nostradamus saw the dissolution of the Roman Catholic Church as the end of the world. He could not imagine civilization without it. Hence, many of his later predictions should be read with this in mind. In your terms, and in your terms only, the coming of Christ was the second coming. In those terms, and again this is important, in those terms only, he appeared at the time of Atlantis, but the records were destroyed and forgotten. Now, again in those terms, he is an entity who appears time and time again within your physical system, but he has been recognized on only two occasions, once in Atlantis and once in the Christ story as it has come down to you in all of its distortions. He appears and reappears, therefore, sometimes making himself known and sometimes not. He was not one personality, as I have told you, but a highly developed entity, sometimes appearing as a fragment of himself. In your terms, he eternally weaves himself within the fabric of your time and space, 
born again and again into the world of flesh, being a part of it while also independent of it, even as you are all a part of it but independent of it. The third historical personage, already born in your terms and a portion of the entire Christ personality, had superior energy and power and great organizing abilities. But it was the errors that he made unwittingly that perpetuated some dangerous distortions. The records of that historical period are scattered and contradictory. The man, historically now, was Paul or Saul. It was given to him to set up a framework. But it was to be a framework of ideas, not of regulations, of men, not of groups. Here he fell down, and he will return as the third personality in your future. Paul tried to deny knowing who he was until his experience with conversion. Allegorically, he represented a warring faction of the self that fights against his own knowledge and is oriented in a highly physical manner. It seemed he went from one extreme to another, being against Christ and then for him. But the inner vehemence was always present, the inner fire, and the recognition that he tried for so long to hide. His was the portion that was to deal with physical reality and manipulation, and so these qualities were strong in him. To some extent they overruled him. When the historical Christ died, Paul was to implement the spiritual ideas in physical terms, to carry on. In so doing, however, he grew the seeds of an organization that would smother the ideas. He lingered after Christ, just as John the Baptist came before. Together, the three span some time period, you see. John and the historical Christ each performed their roles and were satisfied that they had done so. Paul alone was left at the end unsatisfied, and so it is about his personality that the future Christ will form. The entity of which these personalities are part, that entity, which you may call the Christ entity, was aware of these issues. The earthly personalities were not aware of them, although in periods of trance and exaltation much was made known to them. Paul also represented the militant nature of man that had to be taken into consideration in line with man's development at the time. That militant quality in man will completely change in nature and be dispensed with as you know it when the next Christ personality emerges. It is therefore appropriate that Paul be present. In the next century, the inner nature of man, with these developments, will free itself from many constraints that have bound it. A new era will indeed begin, not a heaven on earth, but a far more sane and just world, in which man is far more aware of his relationship with his planet and of his freedom within time. The third personality of Christ will indeed be known as a great psychic, for it is he who will teach humanity to use those inner senses that alone make true spirituality possible. Slayers and victims will change roles as reincarnational memories rise to the surface of consciousness. Through the development of these abilities, the sacredness of all life will be intimately recognized and appreciated. An open-ended consciousness will feel its connections with all other living beings. The continuity of consciousness will become apparent. Man's experience will be so extended that to you the race will seem to have changed into another. This does not mean there will not be problems. It does mean that man will have far greater resources at his command. It also presupposes a richer and far more diverse social framework. Men and women will find themselves relating to their brethren, not only as the people that they are, but as the people that they were. Now, some final words, a goodbye and an introduction. The soul knows itself and is not confused by terms or definitions. Through showing you the nature of my own reality, I hope to teach you the nature of your own. You are not bound to any category or corner of existence. Your reality cannot be measured any more than mine. I hope to illustrate the function of consciousness and personality through speaking these words and enlarging your concepts. The soul is open-ended. It is not a closed spiritual or psychic system. I have tried to show you that the soul is not a separate, apart from you thing. It is no more divorced from you than God is. There is no need to create a separate God who exists outside of your universe and separate from it. Nor is there any need to think of a soul as some distant entity. 
God, or all that is, is intimately a part of you. His energy forms your identity, and your soul is a part of you in the same manner. The answers to the nature of reality, the intimate knowledge of all that is, that you all seek, is within your present experience. It will not be found outside of yourselves, but through an inner journey into yourself, through yourself, and through the world you know. All of existence and consciousness is interwoven. Only when you think of the soul as something different, separate, and therefore closed, are you led to consider a separate God, a personality that seems to be apart from creation. You are not fated to dissolve into all that is. The aspects of your personality, as you presently understand them, will be retained. All that is, is the creator of individuality, not the means of its destruction. My own previous personalities are not dissolved into me any more than your past personalities. All are living and vital. All go their own way. Your future personalities are as real as your past ones. After a while, this will no longer concern you. Out of the reincarnational framework, there is no death as you think of it. Personality changes, whether it is within a body or outside of it. So you will change after death as you change before it. In those terms, it is ridiculous to insist upon remaining as you are now, after death. It is the same as a child saying, I am going to grow up, but I am never going to change the ideas that I have now. The multidimensional qualities of the psyche allow it to experience an endless realm of dimensions. Experience in one dimension in no way negates existence in another. You have been trying to squeeze the soul into tight concepts of the nature of existence, making it follow your limited beliefs. The door to the soul is open, and it leads to all the dimensions of experience. If you think, however, that the self as you know it is the end or summation of yourself, then you also imagine your soul to be a limited entity, bounded by its present ventures in one life alone, to be judged accordingly after death on the performance of a few paltry years. In many ways this is a cozy concept, though to some it can be quite frightening with its connotations of eternal damnation. It is far too tidy an idea, however, to hint at the rich embellishments that are at the heart of divine creativity. The soul stands both within and without the fabric of physical life as you know it. You are not separated from the animals and the rest of existence by virtue of possessing an eternal inner consciousness. Such a consciousness is present within all living beings and in all forms. I titled this section, A Goodbye and an Introduction. The goodbye is my own, since I am now coming to a close. The introduction applies to each of you, for I hope that you will now be able to meet yourself face to face with a greater understanding of who and what you are. I would like, therefore, to introduce you to yourself. You will not find yourself by running from teacher to teacher, from book to book. You will not meet yourself through following any particular specialized method of meditation. Only by looking quietly within the self that you know can your own reality be experienced. With those connections that exist between the present or immediate self and the inner identity that is multidimensional. There must be a willingness, an acquiescence, a desire. If you do not take the time to examine your own subjective states, then you cannot complain if so many answers seem to elude you. You cannot throw the burden of proof upon another or expect a man or teacher to prove to you the validity of your own existence. Such a procedure is bound to lead you into one subjective trap after another. As you listen to these words, the doorways within are open. You have only to experience the moment as you know it as fully as possible, as it exists physically within the room or outside in the streets of the city in which you live. Imagine the experience present in one moment of time over the globe, then try to appreciate the subjective experience of your own that exists in the moment and yet escapes it, and this multiplied by each living individual. This exercise alone will open your perceptions, increase your awareness, and automatically expand your appreciation of your own nature. The you, who is capable of such expansion, must be a far more creative and multidimensional personality than you earlier imagined. Each of you should in one way or another sense his own vitality in a way quite new to him and find avenues of expansion opening within himself 
of which he was earlier unaware. The very nature of these words, the method of their creation and delivery, in themselves should clearly point out the fact that human personality has far more abilities than those usually ascribed to it. By now you should understand that all personalities are not physically materialized, as this was conceived and written by a non-physical personality and then made physical, so do each of you have access to greater abilities and methods of communication than those usually accepted. I hope that in one way or another my words have served to give each of you an introduction to the inner, multidimensional identity that is your own. And that, my dear friend, is the end. And we are finished. If you hate another person, that hate may bind you to him through as many lives as you allow the hate to consume you. You draw to yourself in this existence and in all others those qualities upon which you concentrate your attention. If you vividly concern yourself with the injustices you feel have been done you, then you attract more such experience. And if this goes on, then it will be mirrored in your next existence. It is true that in between lives there is time for understanding and contemplation. Those who do not take advantage of such opportunities in this life often do not do so when it is over. Consciousness will expand. It will create. It will turn itself inside out to do so. There is nothing outside of yourself that will force you to understand these issues or face them. It is useless then to say, when this life is over I will look back upon my experience and then my ways. This is like a young man saying, when I grow old,